Chapter One of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One. Andrew Tallant stepped out of the quaint little train on to the flower-bedecked platform of this devonshire hamlet amongst the hills to receive a surprise so immeasurable that for a moment he could do nothing but gaze silently at the tall ungainly figure whose unpleasant smile betrayed the fact that this meeting was not altogether accidental so far as he was concerned miller he exclaimed a little aimlessly why not was the almost challenging reply you are not the only great statesman who needs to step off the treadmill now and then there was a certain quiet contempt in talents uplifted eyebrows the contrast between the two men momentarily isolated on the little platform was striking and extreme talent had the bearing the voice and the manner which were his heritage education and natural culture miller who was the son of a postman in a small scotch town an exhibitor so far as regards his education and a mimic where social gifts were concerned had all the aggressive bumptiousness of the successful man who has wit enough to receive his shortcomings in his ill-chosen tourist clothes untidy collar and badly arranged tie he presented a contrast to his companion of which he seemed in a way bitterly conscious you are staying near here talent inquired civilly over near linton dartrey has a cottage there i came down yesterday surely you were in hellsville the day before yesterday miller smiled ill-naturedly i was he admitted and i flatter myself that i was able to make the speech which settled your chances in that direction talent permitted a slight note of scorn to creep into his tone. It was not your eloquence, he said, or your arguments which brought failure upon me. It was partly your lies and partly your tactics. An unwholesome flush rose in the other's face. Lies, he repeated a little truculently. Talent looked him up and down. The station master was approaching now. The whistle had blown. Their conversation was at an end. I said lies, Talent observed, most advisedly. The train was already on the move, and the departing passenger was compelled to step hurriedly into a carriage. Talent, waited upon by the obsequious station master, strolled across the line to where his car was waiting. It was not until his arrival there that he realized that Miller had offered him no explanation as to his presence on the platform of this tiny wayside station did you notice the person with whom i was talking he asked the station master a tall thin gentleman in knickerbockers yes sir the man replied part of your description is correct talent remarked dryly do you know what he was doing here been down to your house i believe sir he arrived by the early train this morning and asked the way to the manor to my house talent repeated incredulously it was the manner he asked for sir the station master assured his questioner begging your pardon sir is it true that he was miller the socialist in p true enough was the brief reply what of it the man coughed as he deposited the dispatch box which he had been carrying on the seat of the waiting car they think a lot of him down in these parts sir he observed a little apologetically talent made no answer to the station master's last speech and merely waved his hand a little mechanically as the car drove off his mind was already busy with the problems suggested by miller's appearance in these parts for the first few minutes of his drive he was back again in the turmoil which he had left then with a little shrug of the shoulders he abandoned this new enigma its solution must be close at hand arrived at the edge of the dusty white strip of road along which he had travelled over the moors from the station 
tallente leaned forward and watched the unfolding panorama below with a little start of surprise he had passed through acres of yellowing gorse of purple heather and mossy turf fragrant with the aromatic perfume of sun-baked herbage in the distance the moorland reared itself into strange promontories outflung to the sea on his right a little farm with its cluster of outbuildings nestled in the bosom of the hills on either side the fields still stretched upward like patchwork to a clear sky but below down into the hollow blotting out all that might lie beneath was a curious sea of rolling white mist soft and fleecy yet impenetrable Talon, who had seen very little of this newly chosen country home of his had the feeling as the car crept slowly downward of one about to plunge into a new life to penetrate into an unknown world a man of extraordinarily sensitive perceptions leading him often outside the political world in which he fought the battle of life he was conscious of a curious and grim premonition as the car crawling down the precipitous hillside approached and was enveloped in the gray shroud the world which a few minutes before had seemed so wonderful the sunlight the distant view of the sea the perfumes of flowers and shrubs had all gone the car was crawling along a rough and stony road between hedges dripping with moisture and trees dimly seen like spectres at last about three-quarters of the way down to the sea after an abrupt turn they entered a winding avenue and emerged on to a terrace the chauffeur who had felt the strain of the drive ran a little past the front door and pulled up in front of an uncurtained window tallente glanced in dazzled a little at first by the unexpected lamplight then he understood the premonition which had sat shivering in his heart during the long descent the mist which had hung like a spectral curtain over the little demesne of martinhoe manor had almost entirely disappeared when at a few minutes before eight with all traces of his long journey obliterated andrew tallente stepped out on to the stone flagged terrace and looked out across the little bay below the top of the red sandstone cliff opposite was still wreathed with mists but the sunlight lay upon the tennis lawn the flower gardens below and the rocks almost covered by the full swelling tide tall and looking slimmer than ever in his plain dinner garb there was some indications of an hour of strange and unexpected suffering in the tired face of the man who gazed out in somewhat dazed fashion at the little panorama which he had been looking forward so eagerly to seeing again throughout the long journey down from town he had felt an unusual and almost boyish enthusiasm for his coming holiday he had thought of his tennis racket and fishing rods wondered about his golf clubs and his guns even the unexpected encounter with miller had done little more than leave an unpleasant taste in his mouth and then on his way down from up over as the natives called that little strip of moorland overhead he had vanished into the mist and had come out into another world andrew so you are out here why did you not come to my room surely your train was very punctual tallente remained for a moment tense and motionless then he turned around the woman who stood upon the threshold of the house framed with a little cascade of drooping roses sought for his eyes almost hungrily he realized how she must be feeling a dormant vein of cynicism parted his lips as he held her fingers for a moment his tone and his manner were quite natural we were i believe unusually punctual he admitted what an extraordinary mist up over there was no sign of it at all she shivered her eyes were still watching his face seeking for an answer to her unasked question blue eyes they were which had been beautiful in their day a little hard and anxious now she wore a white dress simple with the simplicity of supreme and expensive art a rope of pearls was her only ornament her hair was somewhat elaborately coiffured there was a touch of rouge upon her cheeks 
and the unscreened evening sunlight was scarcely kind to her rather wan features and carefully arranged complexion she still had her claims to beauty however tallente admitted that to himself as he stood there appraising her with a strange and almost impersonal regard his wife of thirteen years she was beautiful notwithstanding the strained look of anxiety which at that moment disfigured her face the lurking fear which made her voice sound artificial the nervousness which every moment made fresh demands upon her self-restraint it came up from the sea she said one moment tony and i were sitting out under the trees to keep away from the sun and the next we were driven shivering indoors it was just like running into a fog bank in the middle of the atlantic on a hot summer's day i found the difference in temperature amazing he observed i too dropped from the sunshine into a strange chill she tried to get rid of the subject so you lost your seat she said i am very sorry tell me how it happened he shrugged his shoulders the democratic party made up their mind for some reason or other that i shouldn't sit the labor party generally were not thinking of running a candidate i was to have been returned unopposed in acknowledgment of my work on the nationalization bill the democrats however ratted they put up a man at the last moment and well you know the result i lost i don't understand english politics she confessed but i thought you were almost a labor man yourself i am practically he replied i don't know even now what made them oppose me what about the future my plans are not wholly made for the first time an old and passionate ambition prevailed against the thrall of the moment one of the papers this morning she said eagerly suggested that you might be offered a peerage i saw it he acknowledged it was in the sun i was once unfortunate enough to be on the committee of a club which blackballed the editor her mouth hardened a little but you haven't forgotten your promise bargain shall we call it he replied no i have not forgotten tony says you could have a peerage whenever you liked then i suppose it must be so just at present i am not prepared to write fini to my political career the butler announced dinner tallente offered his arm and they passed through the homely little hall into the dining-room beyond stella came to a sudden standstill as they crossed the threshold why is the table laid for two only she demanded mr palliser is here i was obliged to send tony away on important business tallente intervened he left about an hour ago once more the terror was upon her the fingers which gripped her napkin trembled her eyes filled with fierce inquiry were fixed upon her husband's as he took his place in leisurely fashion and glanced at the menu obliged to send tony away she repeated i don't understand he told me that he had several days work here with you something intervened he murmured why didn't you wire she faltered almost under her breath he couldn't have had any time to get ready andrew tallente looked at his wife across the bowl of floating flowers ah he exclaimed i didn't think of that but in any case i did not make up my mind until i arrived that it was necessary for him to go there was a silence for a time an unsatisfactory and in some respects an unnatural silence tallente trifled with his hors d'oeuvres and was inquisitive about the sauce with which his fish was flavoured stella sent away her plate untouched but drank two glasses of champagne the light came back into her eyes she found courage again after all she was independent of this man independent even of his name she looked across the table at him appraisingly he was still sufficiently good-looking lithe of frame and muscular with features well cut although a little irregular in outline time however and anxious work were beginning to leave their marks his hair was gray at the sides there were deep lines in his face he seemed to her fancy to have shrunken a little during the last few years he had still the languid high-bred voice which she had always admired so much 
the same coolness of manner and quiet dignity he was a personable man but after all he was a failure his career so far as she could judge it was at an end she was a fool to imagine even for a moment that her whole future lay in his keeping have you any plans she asked him presently another constituency he smiled a little wearily for once he spoke quite naturally the only plan i have formulated at present is to rest for a time he admitted she drank another glass of champagne and felt almost confident she told him the small events of the sparsely populated neighborhood spoke of the lack of water in the trout stream the improvement in the golf links the pheasants which a nearby landowner was turning down they were comparative newcomers and had seen as yet little of their neighbors i was told she concluded that the great lady of the neighborhood was to have called upon me this afternoon i waited in but she didn't come and who was that he inquired lady jane partington of woolhanger a daughter of the duke of barminster woolhanger was left to her by an old aunt and they say that she never leaves the place an elderly lady he asked merely with an intent of prolonging a harmless subject of conversation on the contrary quite young his wife replied she seems to be a sort of bachelor spinster who lives out in that lonely place without a chaperon and rules the neighborhood you ought to make friends with her andrew they say that she is half a socialist by the by how long are we going to stay down here we will discuss that presently he answered the service of dinner came to its appointed end talent drank one glass of port alone then he rose left the room by the french windows passed along the terrace and looked in at the drawing-room where stella was lingering over her coffin will you walk with me as far as the lookout he invited your maid can bring you a cloak if you are likely to be cold she responded a little ungraciously but appeared a few minutes later a filmy shawl of lace covering her bare shoulders she walked by his side to the end of the terrace along the curving walk through the plantation and by the sea wall to the flagged space where some seats and a table had been fixed four hundred feet below the sea was beating against jagged rocks the moon was late and it was almost dark she leaned over and he stood by her side stella he said you asked me at dinner when we were leaving here you are leaving tomorrow morning by the twelve thirty train what do you mean she demanded with a certain sinking of the heart please do not ask he replied you know and i know it is not my wish to make public the story of our disagreement she was silent for several moments looking over into the black gulf below watching the swirl of the sea listening to its dull booming against the distant rocks the shriek of the backward dragged pebbles an owl flew out from some secret place in the cliffs and wheeled across the bay she drew her shawl around her with a little shiver so this is the end she answered no doubt in my way he reflected i have been as great a disappointment to you as you to me you brought me your great wealth believing that i could use it towards securing just what you desired in the way of social position perhaps that might have come but for the war now i have become rather a failure there is no necessity for you ever to have gone soldiering she reminded him a little hardly as you say he acquiesced still i went and do not regret it i might even remind you that i met with some success pooh she scoffed what is the use of a few military distinctions what are an m c and a d s o and a few french and belgian orders going to do for me you know i want other things they told me when i married you she went on warming her own sense of injury that you were certain to be prime minister they told me that the coalition party couldn't do without you that you were the only effective link between them and labor you had only to play your cards properly and you could have pushed out horlock whenever you liked and now see what a mess you have made of things you have built up horlock's party for him he offers you an insignificant post in the cabinet 
and you can't even win your seat in parliament your epitome of my later political career has its weak points but i dare say from your point of view you have every reason for complaint he observed since i have failed to procure for you the position you desire our parting will have a perfectly natural appearance your fortune is unimpaired you cannot say that i have been extravagant and i assure you that i shall not regret my return to poverty but you won't be able to live she said bluntly you haven't any income at all believe me he answered quietly you exaggerate my poverty in any case it is not your concern you wouldn't she paused she was a woman of not very keen perceptions but she realized that if she were to proceed with the offer which was half framed in her mind the man by her side with his to her outlook distorted sense of honour would become her enemy she shrugged her shoulders and turning towards him held out her hand it is the end then she said well andrew i did my best according to my lights and i failed will you shake hands he shook his head i cannot stella let us agree to part here we know all there is to be known of one another and we shall be able to say good-bye without regret she drifted slowly away from him he watched her figure pass in and out among the trees she was unashamed perhaps relieved probably he reflected as he watched her enter the house already making her plans for a more successful future he turned away and looked downwards the darkness seemed if possible to have become a little more intense the moaning of the sea more insistent little showers of white spray enlaced the sombre rocks the owl came back from his mysterious journey hovered for a moment over the cliff and entered his secret home behind him the lights in the house went out one by one suddenly he felt a grip upon his shoulder a hot breath upon his cheek it was stella returned dishevelled her lace scarf streaming behind her eyes lit with horror andrew she cried it came over me just as i entered the house what have you done with anthony End of chapter one chapter two of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. reading by matt Berard. chapter two talent's first impressions of jane portington were that an exceedingly attractive but somewhat imperious young woman had surprised him in a most undignified position she had come cantering down the drive on a horse which by comparison with the exmoor ponies which every one rode in those parts had seemed gigantic and finding a difficulty in making her presence known had motioned to him with her whip he climbed down from the steps where he had been busy fastening up some roses removed a nail from his mouth and came towards her how is it that i can make no one hear she asked do you know if mrs talent is at home talent was in no hurry to reply he was busy taking in a variety of pleasant impressions notwithstanding the severely cut riding habit and the hard little hat he decided that he had never looked into a more attractively feminine face for some occult reason unconnected he was sure with the use of any skin food or face cream this young woman who had the reputation of living out of doors winter and summer had a complexion which notwithstanding its faint shade of tan would have passed muster for delicacy and clearness in any mayfair drawing-room her eyes were soft and brown her hair a darker shade of the same colour her mouth for all its firmness was soft and pleasantly curved her tone though a trifle imperative was kindly gracious and full of musical quality her figure was moderately slim but indistinguishable at that moment under her long coat she possessed a curious air of physical well-being the well-being of a woman who has found and is enjoying what she seeks in life 
won't you tell me why i can make no one hear she repeated still good-naturedly but frowning slightly at his silence mrs tallente is in london he announced she has taken most of the establishment with her the visitor fumbled in her side pocket and produced a diminutive ivory case she withdrew a card and handed it to tallente with a glance of his gloved hands will you give this to the butler she begged tell him to tell his mistress that i was sorry not to find her at home the butler tallente explained has gone for the milk he shall have the card immediately on his return she looked at him for a moment and then smiled do forgive me she said i believe you are mr tallente he drew off his gloves and shook hands how did you guess that he asked from the illustrated papers of course she answered i have come to the conclusion that you must be a very vain man i have seen so many pictures of you lately a matter of snapshots he replied for which as a rule the victim is not responsible you should abjure such a journalistic vice as picture papers why she laughed they lead to such pleasant surprises i had been led to believe for instance by studying the daily mirror that you were quite an elderly person with a squint i am becoming self-conscious he confessed won't you come in there is a boy somewhere about the premises who can look after your horse and i shall be able to give you some tea as soon as robert gets back with the milk he cooed to the boy who came up from one of the lower shelves of garden and she followed him into the hall he looked around him for a moment in some perplexity i wonder whether you would mind coming into my study he suggested i am here quite alone for the present and it is the only room i use she followed him down a long passage into a small apartment at the extreme end of the house you are like me she said i keep most of my room shut up and live in my den a lonely person needs so much atmosphere rather pigsty isn't it he remarked sweeping a heap of books from a chair i am without a secretary just now in fact he went on with a little burst of confidence engendered by her friendly attitude we are in a mess altogether she laughed softly leaning back amongst the cushions of the chair and looking around the room her kindly eyes filled with interest it is a most characteristic mess she declared i am sure an interviewer would give anything for this glimpse into your tastes and habits golf clubs all cleaned up and ready for action trout rod newly waxed at the joints you must try my stream there is no water in yours tennis rackets in a very excellent press i wonder whether you're too good for a single with me some day typewriter rather dusty i don't believe that you can use it i can't he admitted i have been writing my letters by hand for the last two days she sighed men are helpless creatures fancy a great politician unable to write his own letters what has become of your secretary tallent threw some books to the floor and seated himself in the vacant easy chair i shall begin to think he said a little querulously that you don't read the newspapers my secretary according to that portion of the press which guarantees to provide full value for the smallest copper coin has disappeared really she exclaimed he or she he the honourable anthony palliser by name son of stobart palliser who was at eton with me she nodded i expect i know his mother what exactly do you mean by disappeared tallente was looking out of the window a slight hardness had crept into his tone and manner he had the air of one reciting a story the young man and i differed last tuesday night he said in the language of the novelists he walked out into the night and disappeared only an hour before dinner too nothing has been heard of him since what a fatuous thing to do she remarked shall you have to get another secretary presently he assented just for the moment i am rather enjoying doing nothing she leaned back amongst the cushions of her chair and looked across at him with interest an interest which presently drifted into sympathy even the lightness of his tone could not mask the inwritten weariness of the man 
the tired droop of the mouth and the lacklustre eyes do you know she said i have never been more intrigued than when i heard you were really coming down here last summer i was in scotland in fact i have been away every time the manor has been open i am so anxious to know whether you like this part of the world i like it so much he replied that i feel like settling here for the rest of my life she shook her head you will never be able to do that she said at least not for many years the country will need so much of your time but it is delightful to think that you may come here for your holidays if you read the newspapers he remarked a little grimly you might not be so sure that the country is clamoring for my services she waved away his speech with a little gesture of contempt rubbish your defeat at hellsville was a matter of political jobbery any one could see through that horlock ought never to have sent you there he ought to have found you a perfectly safe seat and of course he will have to do it he shook his head i am not so sure horlock resents my defeat almost as though it were a personal matter besides it is an age of young men lady jane young men she scoffed but you are young am i he answered a little sadly i am not feeling it just now besides there is something wrong about my enthusiasms they are becoming altogether too pastoral i am rather thinking of taking up the cultivation of roses and of making a terraced garden down to the sea do you know anything about gardening lady jane of course i do she answered a little impatiently a very excellent hobby it is for women and dreamers and elderly men there is plenty of time for you to take up such a pursuit when you have finished your work fifteen thousand intelligent voters have just done their best to tell me that it is already finished he sighed she made a little grimace am i going to be disappointed in you i wonder she asked i don't think so you surely wouldn't let a little affair like one election drive you out of public life it was so obvious that you were made the victim for horlock's growing unpopularity in the country haven't you realized that yourself or perhaps you don't care to talk about these things to an ignoramus such as i am please don't believe that he begged hastily i think yours is really the common-sense view of the matter only he went on i have always represented amongst the coalitionists the moderate socialist the views of those men who recognize the power and force of the coming democracy and desire to have legislation attuned to it yet it was the democratic vote which upset me at housefield that was entirely a matter of faction she persisted that horrible person miller was sent down there for some reason or other to make trouble i believe that the election had been delayed another week and you had been able to make two more speeches like you did at the corn exchange you would have got in he looked at her in some surprise that is exactly what i thought myself he agreed how on earth do you come to know all these things i take an interest in your career she said smiling at him and i hate to see you so dejected without cause you felt a little thrill at her words a queer new sense of companionship stirred in his pulses the bitterness of his suppressed disappointment was suddenly soothed there was something of the excitement of the discoverer too in these new sensations it seemed to him that he was finding something which had been choked out of his life and which was yet a real and natural part of it you will make an awful nuisance of me if you don't mind he warned her if you encourage me like this you will develop the most juvenile of all failings you will make me want to talk about myself i am beginning to feel terribly egotistical already she leaned a little towards him her mouth was soft with sweet and feminine tenderness her eyes warm with kindness that is just what i hoped i might succeed in doing she declared i have been interested in your career ever since i had the faintest idea of what politics meant you could not give me a greater happiness than to talk to me about yourself End of Chapter 2
e phillips oppenheim this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. chapter three very soon tea was brought in the homely service of the meal and robert's plain clothes seemed to demand some sort of explanation it was she who provided the opening will your wife be long away she inquired Talent looked at his guest thoughtfully. She was pouring out tea from an ordinary brown earthenware pot with an air of complete absorption in her task. The friendliness of her seemed somehow to warm the atmosphere of the room, even as her sympathy had stolen into the frozen places of his life. For the moment, he ignored her question. His eyes appraised her critically, reminiscently. There was something vaguely familiar in the frank sweetness of her tone and manner. I am going to make the most idiotically commonplace remark, he said. I cannot believe that this is the first time we have met. It isn't, she replied, helping herself to strawberry. Are you in earnest? he asked, puzzled. Do you mean that I have spoken to you? Absolutely. Not only that, but you have made me a present. He searched the recesses of his memory in vain. She smiled at his perplexity and began to count on her fingers let me see she said exactly fourteen years ago you arrived in paris from london on a confidential mission to a certain person to lord peters he exclaimed she nodded you had half an hour to spare after you had finished your business and you begged to see the young people maggie peters was always a friend of yours you came into the morning room and i was there you yes i was at school in paris and i was spending my half-holiday with maggie the little brown girl he murmured i never heard your name and when i sent the chocolates i had to send them to the young lady in brown of course i remember but your hair was down your back you had freckles and you were as silent as a mouse you see how much better my memory is than yours she laughed i am not so sure he objected you took me for the gardener just now not when you came down the steps she protested and besides it is your own fault for wearing such atrociously old clothes they shall be given away to-morrow he promised i should think so she replied and you might part with the battered straw hat you were wearing at the same time it shall be done he promised meekly she became reminiscent we were all so interested in you in those days lord peters told us after you were gone that some day you would be prime minister i am afraid he sighed that i have disappointed most of my friends you have disappointed no one she assured him firmly you will disappoint no one you are the one person in politics who has kept a steadfast course and if you have lost ground a little in the country and slipped out of people's political appreciation during the last decade don't we all know why every one of your friends and your wife of course she put in hastily must be proud that you have lost ground there isn't another man in the country who gave up a great political career to learn his drill in a cadet corps who actually served in the trenches through the most terrible battles of the war and came out of it a brigadier general with all your distinctions he felt his heart suddenly swell no one had ever spoken to him like this the newspapers had been complimentary for a day and had accepted the verdict of circumstances the next his wife had simply been the reflex of other people's opinion and the trend of events you make me feel he told her earnestly almost for the first time that after all it was worth while the light unsteadiness of his tone at first surprised then brought her almost to the point of confusion their eyes met a startled glance on her part merely to assure herself that he was in earnest and afterwards there was a moment's embarrassment she accepted the cigarette and went back to her easy chair you did not answer the question i asked you a few minutes ago she reminded him when is your wife returning the shadow was back on his face lady jane he said if it were not that we are old friends dating from that box of chocolates remember i might have felt that i must make you some sort of a formal reply 
but as it is i shall tell you the truth my wife is not coming back not at all she exclaimed to me never he answered we have separated i am so very sorry she said after a moment's startled silence i am afraid that i asked a tactless question but how could i know there was nothing tactless about it he assured her it makes it much easier for me to tell you i married my wife thirteen years ago because i believed that her wealth would help me in my career she married me because she was an american with ambitions anxious to find a definite place in english society she has been disappointed in me other circumstances have now presented themselves i have discovered that my wife's affections are bestowed elsewhere to be perfectly honest the discovery was a relief to me so that is why you are living down here like this she murmured precisely the one thing for which i am grateful he went on is that i always refused to let my wife take a big country house i insisted upon an unpretentious place for the times when i could rest i think that i shall settle down here altogether i can just afford to live here if i shoot plenty of rabbits and if robert's rheumatism is not too bad for him to look after the vegetable garden of course you are talking nonsense she pronounced a little curtly why nonsense you must go back to your work she insisted keep this place for your holiday moments certainly but for the rest to talk of settling down here is simply wicked what is my work he asked i tell you frankly that i do not know where i belong a very intelligent constituency stuffed up to the throat with school board education has determined that it would prefer a representative who has changed his politics already four times i seem to be nobody's man horlock at heart is frightened of me because he is convinced that i am not sound and he has only tried to make use of me as a sop to democracy the whigs hate me like a poison hate me even worse than horlock if i were in parliament i should not know which party to support i think i shall devote my time to roses and between september and may i shall hibernate and think about them of course she said with the air of one humouring a child you are not in earnest you have just been through a very painful experience and you are suffering from it as for the rest you are talking nonsense explain please he begged you said just now that you did not know where your place was she continued you called yourself nobody's man why the most ignorant person who thinks about things could tell you where you belong even i could tell you please do he invited she rose to her feet walk round the garden with me she begged brushing the cigarette ash from her skirt you know what a terrible out-of-door person i am this room seems to me close i want to smell the sea from one of those wonderful lookouts of yours he walked with her along one of the lower paths deliberately avoiding the upper lookouts they came presently to a grass-grown pier she stood at the end her firm capable fingers clenching the stone wall her eyes looking seaward i will tell you where you belong she said in your heart you must know it but you are suffering from that reaction which comes from failure to those people who are not used to failure you belong to the head of things you should hold up your right hand and the party you should leave should form itself about you no don't interrupt me she went on you and all of us know that the country is in a bad way she is feeling all the evils of a too great prosperity thrust upon her after a period of suffering you can see the dangers ahead i learned them first from you in the pages of the reviews when after the war you foretold the exact position in which we find ourselves today industrial wealth means the building up of a new democracy the democracy already exists but it is unrepresented because those people who should form its bulwark and its strength are attached to various factions of what is called the labor party they don't know themselves yet no rienzi has arisen to hold up the looking-glass if someone does not teach them to find themselves there will be trouble 
mind i am only repeating what you have told others it is all true he agreed then can't you see she continued eagerly what party it is to which you ought to attach yourself the party which is broken up now into half a dozen factions they are all misnamed but that is no matter you should stand for parliament as a labor or a socialist candidate because you understand what the people want and what they ought to have you should draw up a new and final program you are a wonderful person he said with conviction but like all people who are clear-sighted and who have imagination you are also a theorist i believe your idea is the true one but to stand for parliament as a labor member you have to belong to one of the acknowledged factions to be sure of any support at all an independent member can count his votes by the capital that is the old system she pointed out firmly it is for you to introduce a new one if necessary you must stoop to political cunning you should make use of those very factions until you are strong enough to stand by yourself through their enmity amongst themselves one of them would come to your side anyway but i should like to see you discard all old parliamentary methods i should like to see you speak to the heart of the man who is going to record his vote it is a slow matter to win votes in units he reminded her but it is the real way she insisted voting by party and government by party will soon come to an end it must all that it needs is a strong man with a definite program of his own to attack the whole principle he looked away from the sea towards the woman by his side the wind was blowing in her face blowing back little strands of her tightly coiled hair blowing back her coat and skirt outlining her figure with soft and graceful distinction she was young healthy and splendid full of all the enthusiasm of her age he sighed a little bitterly all that you say he reminded her should have been said to me by the little brown girl in paris years ago i am too old now for great tasks she turned towards him with the pitying and yet pleasant air of one who would correct a child you are forty-nine years old in three months she said how on earth did you know that he demanded she smiled a valuable little red book called who's who you see it is no use your trying to pose as a methuselah for a politician you are a young man you have time and strength for the greatest of all tasks find some other excuse sir if you talk of laying down the sword and picking up the shuttle he looked back seawards his eyes were following the flight of a seagull wailing in the sunlight i suppose you are right he acknowledged no man is too old for work i beg your pardon sir they turned abruptly around they had been so engrossed that they had not noticed the sound of footsteps robert a little out of breath was standing at attention there was a disturbed look in his face a tremor in his voice i beg your pardon sir he repeated there is someone here to see you someone talent repeated impatiently robert leaned a little forward the effort at lowering his voice only made his hoarse whisper sound more agitated a police inspector sir from barnstable is waiting in the study End of chapter three chapter four of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Berard. chapter four mr inspector gillian of barnstaple had no idea of denying his profession he had travelled over in a specially hired motor-car and he was wearing his best uniform he rose to his feet at tallente's entrance and saluted a little ponderously mr tallente sir he inquired tallente silently admitted his identity waved the inspector back to his seat the one high-backed and uncomfortable chair in the room and took an easy chair himself i have come over sir the man continued according to instructions 
received by telephone from scotland yard my business is to ask you a few questions concerning the disappearance of the honourable anthony palliser who was i am given to understand your secretary dear me tallente exclaimed i had no idea that the young man's temporary absence from polite society would be turned into a melodramatic disappearance the inspector took mental note of the levity in tallente's tone and disapproved the honourable anthony palliser disappeared from here sir on tuesday night last the night of your return from london he said i have come to ask you certain questions with reference to that disappearance go ahead tallente begged care to smoke a cigar not whilst i'm duty thank you sir was the dignified reply you will forgive my cigarette tallente observed lighting one now you can go ahead as fast as you like question number one is this sir i wish to know whether mr palliser's abrupt departure from the manor was due to any disagreement with you in a sense i suppose it was the other acknowledged i turned him out of the house the inspector did not attempt to conceal his gratification he made a voluminous note in his pocket-book am i to conclude then that there was a quarrel he inquired i do not quarrel with people to whom i pay a salary tallente replied when you say that you turn him out of the house that rather implies quarrel doesn't it it might even imply blows you can put your own construction upon it was the cool reply have you any idea where the honourable anthony palliser was going to i suggested the devil tallente confided blandly i expect he will get there some time i put up with him because i knew his father but he is not a young man to make a fuss about the inspector was a little staggered i am to conclude then he said that you were dissatisfied with his work as your secretary absolutely was the firm reply you have no idea what a mess he was liable to make of things if he was left alone the inspector coughed mr tallente sir he said my instructions are to ask you to disclose the nature of your displeasure if any with the honourable mr anthony palliser in plain words scotland yard desires to know why he was turned away from his place at a moment's notice i suppose it is the duty of scotland yard to be inquisitive in cases of this sort Pallant observed you can report to them the whole of the valuable information with which i have already furnished you and you can add that i absolutely refuse to give any information respecting the um, difference of opinion between the young man and myself the inspector did not conceal his dissatisfaction i shall ask you sir he said with dignity to reconsider that decision remember that it is the police who ask and in cases of this sort they have special privileges as soon as any criminal case arises from anthony palliser's disappearance tallente pointed out you will be in a position to ask me questions from a different standpoint for the present i have given you just as much information as i feel inclined to shall we leave it at that the inspector appeared to have become hard of hearing he did not attempt to rise from his chair being your private secretary sir he asked the honourable anthony palliser would no doubt have access to your private papers naturally tallente conceded there might be amongst them papers of importance papers whose possession by parties in the other camp of politics stop tallente interrupted inspector gillian you are an astute man excuse me he crossed the room and with a key which he took from a chain attached to his trouser button opened a small but powerful safe fitted into the wall he opened it confidently enough gazed inside and remained for a moment transfixed then he took up a few little packets of papers glanced them through and replaced them he still stood there dangling the key in his hand the inspector watched him curiously anything missing sir he asked tallente swung the door to and came back to his chair yes he admitted can i make a note of the nature of the law sir the man asked moistening his pencil 
a political paper of some personal consequence tallente replied its absence disquiets me it also confirms my belief that palliser is lying doggo for a time a hint as to the contents of the missing paper would be very acceptable sir inspector gillian begged tallente shook his head for the present he decided i can only repeat what i said a few moments ago i have given you just as much information as i feel inclined to the inspector rose to his feet my report will not be wholly satisfactory to scotland yard sir he declared my experience of the estimable body is that they take a lot of satisfying tallente replied will you take anything before you go inspector nothing whatever thank you sir at the risk of annoying you i am bound to ask this question will you tell me whether anything in the nature of blows passed between you and the honourable anthony palliser previous to his leaving your house i will not even satisfy your curiosity to that extent tallente answered it will be my duty sir the inspector said ponderously to examine some of your servants scotland yard can do that for themselves tallente observed my wife and the greater part of the domestic staff left here for london a week ago the representative of the law saluted solemnly i am sorry that you have not felt inclined to treat me with more confidence in this matter mr tallente he said he took his leave then tallente heard him conversing for some time with robert and saw him in the garden interviewing the small boy afterwards he climbed into his car and drove away tallente opened his safe and once more let the little array of folded papers slip through his hands then he rang the bell for robert who presently appeared the inspector has quite finished with you his master asked robert was a portly man a little unhealthy in colour and a little short of breath he had been gassed in the war and his nerves were not what they had been it was obvious as he stood on the other side of the table that he was trembling quite sir he was inquiring about mr palliser his master nodded i am afraid he will find it a little difficult to obtain any information round here he remarked there are certain things connected with that young man which may throw a new light upon his disappearance indeed sir robert murmured tallente glanced towards the safe robert he confided i have been robbed the man started a little indeed sir he replied nothing very valuable i hope i have been robbed of papers tallente said quietly which in the wrong hands might ruin me mr palliser had a key to that safe have you ever seen it open never sir when did mr palliser arrive here on the evening train of the monday sir that you arrived by on the tuesday tell me did he receive any visitors at all on the tuesday there was a man came over from a house near linton sir said his name was miller have you any idea what he wanted no certain idea sir robert replied doubtfully now come to think of it though it seemed as though he had come to make mr palliser some sort of an offer after i had let him out he came back and said something to mr palliser about three thousand pounds and mr palliser said he would let him know i got the idea somehow or other that the transaction whatever it might have been was to be concluded on tuesday night why didn't you tell me this before robert his master inquired other things drove it out of my mind sir the man confessed i didn't look upon it as of much consequence i thought it was something to do with mr palliser's private affairs tallente glanced at the safe i saw this man miller at the station he said when i arrived that would be on his way back from here sir robert acquiesced i gathered he was coming back again after dinner in a car did you hear a car at all that night i rather fancied i did the man asserted i didn't take particular notice though tallente frowned i am very much afraid robert he said that wherever mr palliser is those papers are robert shivered very good sir he said in a low tone any speculations as to that young man's whereabouts tallente continued thoughtfully 
must necessarily be a matter of pure guesswork but supposing robert he should have wandered in that mist the wrong way turned to the left for instance outside this window instead of to the right he might very easily have fallen over the cliff the walk is very unsafe in the dark sir robert acquiesced looking down at the carpet it was not my intention tallente remarked thoughtfully to kill the young man a brawl in front of the windows was impossible so i took him with me to the lookout i suppose he was tactless and i lost my temper i struck him on the chin and he went backwards through that piece of rotting paling you know robert i know sir the man interrupted with a little moan please don't tallente shrugged his shoulders i took him at no disadvantage he said coolly he knew how to use the gloves and he was twenty years younger than i however there it is backwards he went all legs and arms and shrieks and with him went the papers he had stolen at twelve o'clock to-night robert i must go down after him it's impossible sir it's a sheer precipice for four hundred feet nothing of the sort was the cool reply there are heaps of ledges and little clumps of pines and yews all that you will have to do is to pull up the rope when i am ready you can fasten it to a tree when i go down it's not worth it sir the man protested anxiously no one will ever find the body down there send the boy home to stay with his parents to-night tallente continued your wife i suppose can be trusted she is living up at the garage sir robert answered besides she is deaf i'll tell her that i am sleeping in the house to-night as you are not very well and forgive me sir her ladyship left a message she hoped you would lunch with her to-morrow tallent strolled out again in a few minutes curiously impatient of the restraint of walls and clambered up the precipitous field at the back of the manor far up the winding road which led back into the world a motor-car was crawling on its way up over it he watched it through a pair of field-glasses leaning back in the tonneau with folded arms as though solemnly digesting a problem was inspector gillian tallent closed the glasses with a little snap and smiled the bucket type he murmured to himself very much the bucket type End of chapter four Chapter Five of Nobody's Man by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Chapter Five. The moon that night seemed to be indulging in strange vagaries, now dimly visible behind a mist of thin gray vapor, now wholly obscured behind jagged masses of black cloud, and occasionally shining brilliantly from a little patch of clear sky tallente waited for one of the latter moments before he finally tested the rope which was wound around the strongest of the young pine trees and stepped over the rustic wooden paling at the edge of the lookout he stood there balanced between earth and sky until robert who watched him shivered there is nothing to fear his master said coolly remember i am an old hand at mountain climbing robert all the same if anything should happen you'd better say that we fancied we heard a cry from down below and i went to see what it was you understand yes sir tallente took a step into what seemed to be eternity the rope cut into his hands for the first three or four yards as the red sand crumbled away beneath his feet and he was obliged to grip for his life presently he gained a little ledge from which a single yew tree was growing and paused for breath are you all right sir robert called out from above quite was the confident answer i shall be off again in a minute tallente's head had been the wonder even of members of the alpine club years ago in switzerland he found himself now in the strangest of all positions absolutely steady and unmoved sheer below him dark rushing waves broke upon the rocks sending showers of glittering spray upwards above the little lookout with its rustic paling seemed almost more than directly overhead 
the few stars and the fugitive moon seemed somehow set in a different sky he felt a new kinship with the great gull who came floating by he had become himself a creature of the wild places presently he began once more to let himself down hand over hand to where the next little clump of trees showed a chance of a precarious foothold the rope chafed his fingers but he remained absolutely steady once he trusted for a moment to a yew tree growing out of a fissure in the rock which came out by the roots and went hurtling down into space from overhead he heard robert's terrified cry the rope stood the strain of his sudden clutch however and all was well a little lower down holding on with one hand he took his torch from his pocket and examined the surface of the cliff nothing apparently had been disturbed nor was there any sign of any heavy body having been dashed through the undergrowth soon he went on again and working a little to the left stood for a moment upon a green turf-covered crag a tiny plateau covered with the refuse of seagulls and a few stunted trees from amongst which a startled hawk rose with a wild cry he waited here until the moon shone once more and he could see the little strip of shingle below nowhere could he find any trace of the thing he sought at the end of half an hour's climbing he reached the end of the rope the little cove filled with tumbled rocks and a narrow strip of beach was still about eighty feet below the slope here was far less precipitous and there was a foothold in many places amongst the thinly growing firs and dwarfed oaks calmly he let go the rope and commenced to scramble more than once his foot slipped but he was always in a position to save himself the time came at last when he stood upon the pebbly beach surprised to find that his knees were shaking and his breath coming fast the little place was so enclosed that when he looked upwards it seemed as though he were at the bottom of a pit as though the stars and the doubtful moon had receded and he was somehow in the bowels of the earth instead of being on the sea level there were only a few feet of the shingle dry and a great wave breaking amongst the huge rocks drenched him with spray he proceeded with his task however searching methodically amongst the rocks scanning the pebbly beach with his torch always amazed that nowhere could he find the slightest trace of what he sought finally drenched to the skin and utterly exhausted he commenced once more the upward climb he was an hour reaching the end of the rope then he blew the whistle and the rest was easy nevertheless when the paling came into sight and he felt robert's arms under his shoulders he reeled over towards the seat and lay there his clothes caked in red mud the knees of his knickerbockers cut blood on his hands and forehead breathless robert forced brandy down his throat however and in a moment or two he was himself again a miracle he gasped there is nothing there there was something dark i fancied upon the strip of beach sir robert ventured i thought so too it was a tarred plank of timber then the tide must have reached him tallente rose to his feet and looked over the sea alone knows he said for the first time though robert i feel inclined to agree with the newspapers who speak of the strange disappearance of the honourable antimony palliser could any man go backwards over that palisading do you think and save his life robert shook his head miracles can't happen sir he muttered nevertheless tallente said a little gloomily the sea never keeps what the land gives it my fate will rest with the tides robert suddenly gripped his master's arm the moon had disappeared underneath a fragment of cloud and they stood in complete darkness both men listened from one of the paths which led through the grounds from the beach came the sound of muffled footsteps a startled owl flew out and wheeled over their heads with a queer little cry who's that in the grounds robert tallente demanded i've no idea sir 
the latter replied his voice shaking the cottage is empty the boy went home i saw him start off there is no one else about the place nevertheless the footsteps came nearer by and by through the trees came the occasional flash of an electric torch robert turned towards the house but tallente gripped him by the arm stop here he muttered we couldn't get away any one would hear our footsteps along this flinty path besides there is the rope it's someone else searching robert whispered hoarsely the light grew nearer and nearer a little way below the path branched to the right and the left to the left it encircled the tennis lawn and led to the manor or back to the road the path to the right led to the little lookout upon which the two men were standing the footsteps for a moment hesitated then the light flashed out and approached whoever the intruder might be he was making his way directly towards them tallente shrugged his shoulders we must see this through robert he said we were in a tighter corner at eve remember keep as quiet as you can now then tallente flashed on his own torch who's there he asked sternly there was no answer the torch for a moment remained stationary then it began again to advance what are you doing on my grounds tallente demanded who are you a shape loomed into distinctness a bulky man in dark clothes came into sight i am gillian inspector gillian what are you doing out here mr tallente tallente laughed a little scornfully it seems to me that the boot is on the other leg he said i should like to know what the mischief you mean by wandering around my grounds at this hour of the night without my permission the inspector completed his climb and stood in the little circle of light he took note of the rope and of tallente's condition my presence here sir the inspector announced is connected with the disappearance of the honourable anthony palliser confidence for confidence tallente replied so is mine the inspector moved to the palisading the top rail had been broken as though it had given under the weight of some heavy body he held up the loose fragment glanced downwards into the dark gulf and back again to tallente you've been over there he said i have tallente admitted i've made a search that i don't fancy you'd have tackled yourself i've been down the cliff to the beach what reason had you for supposing that you might discover mr palliser's body there the other asked bluntly tallente sat on the stone seat and lit a cigarette i will take you into my confidence mr inspector he said this afternoon i strolled round here with a lady caller just before you came and i fancied that i heard a faint cry i took no notice of it at the time but to-night after dinner i wandered out here again and again i fancied i heard it it got on my nerves to such an extent that i fetched robert here a coil of rope put on some shoes with spikes and tried to remember that i was an alpine climber you've been down to the beach and back sir the inspector asked looking over a little wonderingly every inch of the way the last eighty feet or so i had to scramble did you discover anything sir not a thing i couldn't even find a broken twig in any of the little clumps of outgrowing trees there wasn't a sign of the sand having been disturbed anywhere down the face of the cliff and i shouldn't think a human being had been on that beach during our lifetimes i have had my night's work for nothing it was just the cry you fancied you heard which made you undertake this expedition precisely the inspector held up the broken rail when was this smashed he inquired i have no idea tallente answered all the woodwork about the place is rotten doesn't it occur to you sir as being an extraordinarily dangerous thing to put it back in exactly the same position as though it were sound iniquitous tallente agreed the inspector made a mental note tallente threw the remains of his cigarette into the sea i am going to bed now he said can i offer you any refreshment mr inspector or are your investigations not yet complete i thank you sir but i require nothing 
i have some men up in the wood there and i shall join them presently i am staying in the neighbourhood tallente pointed to the rope if you would care to search for yourself mr inspector we'll help you down the man shook his head scarcely a job for a man of my build sir i have a professional climber coming to-morrow i wish you had informed me of your intention to go down to-night if you had informed me of your intention to remain in the neighbourhood that might have been possible was the cool reply the man took the loose wooden rail from its place and held it under his arm walking off with a portion of my fence eh tallente asked the inspector made no direct reply he turned his torch on to the broken end a clue tallente asked him lightly the other turned away it is not my place sir he announced to share any discovery i might make with a person who has deliberately refused to assist the law no one has convinced me yet tallente replied that palliser's disappearance is a matter in which the law need concern itself the inspector coughed i wish you good night sir he disappeared along the narrow path they listened to his retreating footsteps tallente picked up his end of the rope i was right he said as he led the way back to the house quite the inspector bucket type End of chapter 5chapter six of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter six at noon the next day tallente nervously as well as physically exhausted with the long climb from the manor turned aside from the straight dusty road and seated himself upon a lichen-covered boulder he threw his cap on the ground filled and lighted an old briar pipe and gazed with a queer mixture of feelings across the moorland to where woolhanger spread itself a queer medley of dwelling-house and farm buildings strangely situated at the far end of the tableland he was crossing where the moor leaned down to a great hollow in the hills the open stretch of common which lay between him and his destination had none of the charm of the surrounding country it was like a dark spot set in the midst of the rolling splendours of the moorland proper there were boulders of rock of unknown age dark patches of peatland where even in midsummer the mud oozed up at the lightest footfall pools and sedgy places the home and sometimes the breeding-place of the melancholy snipe of colour there was singularly little the heather bushes were stunted their roots blackened as though with fire and even the yellow of the gorse shone with a dimmer lustre but in the distance a flaming carpet of orange and purple stretched almost to the summit of the brown hills of kindlier soil and farther round westwards richly cultivated fields from which the labourers seemed to hang like insects in the air rolled away almost to the clouds tallente looked at them a little wearily impressed with the allegorical significance of his position it seemed to him that he was in the land to which he belonged the barren land of desolation and failure the triumphs of the past failed for a moment to thrill his pulses the memory of his well-lived and successful life brought him not an atom of consolation the present was all that mattered and the present had brought him to the gates of failure after all what did a man work for he wondered what was the end and aim of it all life at martinhoe manor with a faithful but terrified manservant bookshelves ready to afford him the phantasmal satisfaction of another man's thoughts sea and winds beauties of landscape and colour to bring him to the threshold of an epicurean pleasure which needed yet that one pulsating link with humanity to yield the full meed of joy and content it all came back to the old story of man's weakness he thought as he rose to his feet his teeth almost savagely clenching his pipe he had become a conqueror of circumstances only to become a victim of the primitive needs of life at about a quarter of a mile from the house 
the road branched away to the left to disappear suddenly over the edge of a drop of many hundreds of feet tallant passed through a plain white gate down an avenue of dwarfed oaks to emerge into an unexpectedly green meadow cloven through the middle with a straight white avenue through another gate he passed into a drive which led through flaming banks of rhododendrons now a little past their full glory to the front of the house a long and amplified building which by reason of many additions had become an abode of some pretensions a manservant answered his ring at once and led him into a cool white stone hall the walls of which were hung from floor to ceiling with hunting and sporting trophies her ladyship is still at the farm sir the man announced she said if you came before she returned would you care to step round tallente signified his assent and was led through the house across a more extensive garden from which a marvellous view of the valley and the climbing slopes behind held him spellbound by the side of a small quaintly shaped church to a circular group of buildings of considerable extent the man conducted him to the front of a white plastered cottage covered with roses and knocked at the door this is her ladyship's office sir he announced lady jane's invitation to enter was clear and friendly tallente found her seated behind a desk talking to a tall man in riding clothes who swung around to eye the newcomer with a curiosity which seemed somehow not altogether friendly lady jane held out her hand and smiled delightfully do come in mr tallente she begged i can't tell you how glad i am to see you now you will believe won't you that i am not altogether an idler in life this is my agent mr segerson mr tallente lionel segerson held out his hand he was a tall well-built young devonian sunburnt with fair curly hair a somewhat obstinate type of countenance and dressed in the dandified fashion of the sporting farmer glad to know you mr tallente he said in a tone which lacked enthusiasm i hope you are going to stay down in these parts for a time tallente made only a monosyllabic reply and lady jane with a little gesture of apology continued her conversation with segerson i should like you she directed to see james crockford for yourself try and explain my views to him you know them quite well i want him to own his land you can tell him that within the last two years i have sold eleven farms to their tenants and no one could say that i have not done so on easy terms but i need further convincing that crocker is in earnest about the matter and that he will really work to make his farm a success in five good years he has only saved a matter of four hundred pounds although his rental has been almost insignificant that is the worst showing of any of the tenants on the estate and though if i had more confidence in him i would sell on a mortgage i don't feel inclined to until he has shown that he can do better tell him that he can have the farm for two thousand pounds but he must bring me eight hundred in cash and it must not be borrowed money that ought to satisfy him he must know quite well that i could get three thousand pounds for it in the open market these fellows never take any notice of that segerson remarked ungrateful beggars all of them i'll tell him what you say lady jane thank you anything else the young man asked showing a disposition to linger nothing thanks until to-morrow morning there was even then a slight unwillingness in his departure which provoked a smile from lady jane as the door closed the young men of to-day are terribly spoilt she said he expected to be asked to lunch i am glad he wasn't tallente observed she laughed why not he is quite a nice young man no doubt tallente agreed without conviction however i hate young men and i want to talk to you young men are tiresome sometimes she agreed rising from her chair and older ones too i am afraid she closed her desk and he stood watching her she was wearing an extraordinarily masculine garb a covert coating riding costume with breeches and riding boots concealed under a long coat but she contrived somehow to remain altogether feminine 
she stood for a moment looking about her as though wondering whether there were anything else to be done a capable figure attractive because of her earnest self-possession sarah she called out the sound of a typewriter in an inner room ceased the door was opened and a girl appeared on the threshold you won't see me again to-day unless you send up for me her mistress announced let me have the letters to sign before five try and get away early if you can the car is going in to lenton perhaps you would like the ride i should enjoy it very much your ladyship the girl replied gratefully there is really very little to do this afternoon you can bring the letters whenever you like then lady jane told her and let martin know that you are going in with him you study your people i see tallente remarked as they strolled together back to the house i try she assented i try to do what i can in my little community here very much as you in a far greater way try to study the people in your political program of course she went on it is far easier for me the one thing i try to develop amongst them is a genuine not a false spirit of independence i want them to lean upon no one i have no charities in connection with the estate no soup kitchens or coal at christmas or anything of that sort my theory is that every person is the better for being able to look after himself and my idea of charity is placing him in a position to be able to do it i don't want to be their lady of the manor and accept their rents and give them a dinner i try to encourage them to save money and to buy their own farms the man here who owns his own farm and makes it pay is in a position to lead a thoroughly self-respecting and honourable life he ought to get what there is to be got out of life and his children should be yeoman citizens of the best possible type of course all this sort of thing is so much easier in the country very often in the winter nights here i waste my time trying to think out your greater problems problems he observed which the good people of hellsfield have just decided that i am not the man to solve an election counts for nothing she declared the merest whim will lead thousands of voters into the wrong polling booth besides nearly all the papers admit that your defeat was owing to a political intrigue the very men who should have supported you who had promised to support you in fact went against you at the last moment that was entirely due to miller wasn't it miller has been my political bete noir for years he confessed to me he represents the ignominious pacifist whereas to him i represent the saber rattling jingo i got the best of it while the war was on to-day it seems to me that he has an undue share of influence in the country who are the men who really represent what you and i would understand as labor she asked that is too difficult a question to answer offhand he replied personally i have come to the conclusion that labor is unrepresentable labor as a cause there are too many of the people yet who haven't vision they passed into the cool geranium scented hall she pointed to an easy chair by the side of which was set on a small mahogany table a silver cocktail shaker and two glasses please be as comfortable as you can she begged for a quarter of an hour if you like to wash a touch of the bell there will bring morton i must change my clothes i had to ride out to one of the outlying farms this morning and we came back rather quickly she moved about the hall as she spoke putting little things to rights then she passed up the circular staircase at the bend she looked back and caught him watching her she waved her hand with a little less than her usual frankness tallente had forgotten for a moment his whereabouts his fatigue his general weariness he had turned around in his chair and was watching her she found something in the very intensity of his gaze disturbing vaguely analogous to certain half-formed thoughts of her own she called out some light remark scoffed at herself and ran lightly out of sight calling to her maid as she went End of chapter six chapter seven of nobody's man by e phillips oppenheim 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter 7 Luncheon was served in a small room at the back of the house. Through the wide-flung French windows was a vista of terraced walks, the two sunken tennis lawns, a walled garden leading into an orchard, and beyond the great wood-hung cleft in the hills, on either side of which the pastoral fields, like little squares, stretched away upwards. From here there was no trace of the more barren, unkinder side of the moorland. The succession of rich colors merged at last into the dim, early hue where sky and cloud met. In the golden haze of the August heat, a haze more like a sort of transparent filminess than anything which really obscured. Lady Jane, whose gift of femininity had triumphed even over her farm clothes, seemed to talent to convey a curiously mingled impression of restfulness and delicate charm in her cool white muslin dress low at the neck the paquin made garment of an aphrodite she talked to him with all the charm of an accomplished hostess and yet with the occasional fascinating reserve of the woman who finds her companion something more than ordinarily sympathetic the butler served them unattended from the sideboard but before luncheon was halfway through they dispensed with his services i suppose it has occurred to you by this time mr tallente she said as she watched the coffee in a glass machine by her side that i am a very unconventional person whatever you are he replied i am grateful for cryptic but with quite a nice sort of sound about it she observed smiling tell me honestly though aren't you surprised to find me living here quite alone it seems to me perfectly natural i live without a chaperon she went on because a chaperon called by that name would bore me terribly as a matter of fact though there is generally someone staying here i find it easy enough to persuade my friends and some of my relatives that a corner of exmoor is not half a bad place in the spring and summer it is through the winter that i am generally avoided i have always had a fancy to spend a winter on exmoor he confided it has its compensations she agreed apart of course from the hunting he felt the desire to speak of more vital things what did hunting or chaperons more or less matter to the lady janes of the world already he knew enough of her to be sure that she would have her way in any crisis that might arise how much of the year he asked do you actually spend here as much as i can you are content to be here alone even in the winter more contented than i should be anywhere else she assured him there is always plenty to do useful work too things that count london bores me terribly she confessed foreign travel she nodded more tolerantly i have done a little of it she said i should love to do more but travel as travel is such an unsatisfying thing if a place attracts you you want to imbibe it travel leaves you no time to do anything but sniff life is so short one must concentrate or one achieves nothing i know what the general idea of a stay-at-home is she went on many of my friends consider me narrow perhaps i am anyhow i prefer to lead a complete and i believe useful life here to looking back in later years upon that hodgepodge of lurid sensations tangled impressions and restless moments that most of them call life you display an amazing amount of philosophy for your years he ventured after a little hesitation there is one instinct however which you seem to ignore what is it please shall i call it the gregarious one the desire for companionship of young people of your own age she shrugged her shoulders she had the air of one faintly amused by his diffidence you mean that i ought to be husband hunting she said i quite admit that a husband would be a very wonderful addition to life i have none of the sentiments of the old maid on the other hand i am rather a fatalist if any man is likely to come my way 
whom i should care to marry he is just as likely to find me here as though i tramped the thoroughfares of the world searching for him at last she went on in a changed tone as she poured out his coffee i do hope you will find it good the cigarettes are at your elbow this is quite one of the moments of life isn't it he agreed with her emphatically the council of perfection he murmured as he sniffed the delicate turkish tobacco tell me some more about yourself she shook her head i am much too selfish a person she declared and nothing that i do or say or am amounts to very much i want you to let me a little way into your life to talk either about your soldiering or your politics you have been a cabinet minister and you will be again tell me what it feels like to be one of the world's governors let us finish talking about you first he begged you spoke quite frankly of a husband tell me have you made up your mind what manner of man he must be not in the least i am content to leave that entirely to fate bucolic intellectual an artist a man of affairs she made a little grimace how can i tell i cannot conceive caring for an ordinary person but then every woman feels like that and you see if i did care he wouldn't be ordinary to me and so far as i am concerned she insisted with a shade of restlessness in her manner that finishes the subject you must please devote yourself to telling me at least some of the things i want to know what is the use of having one of the world's successful men tete -te -te, a prisoner to my hospitality unless i can make him gratify my curiosity the thought created by her words burned through his mind like a flash of destroyed lightning one of the world's successful men he repeated is that how i seem to you and to the world she asserted he shook his head sadly i have worked very hard he said i have been very ambitious a few of my ambitions have been gratified but the glory of them has passed with attainment now i enter upon the last lap and i possess none of the things i started out in life to achieve but how absurd she exclaimed you are one of our great politicians you would have to be reckoned with in any regrouping of parties without even a seat in the house of commons he reminded her bitterly and again how can a man be a great politician when there are no politics the confusion amongst the parties has become chaos and i for one have not been clear-sighted enough to see my way through of course i know vaguely what you mean she said but remember that i am only a newspaper educated politician can't you be a little more explicit he lit another cigarette and smoked restlessly for a moment i'll try and explain if i can he went on to be a successful politician from the standard which you or i would aim at a man needs not only political insight but he needs to be able to adopt his views to the practical program of one of the existing parties or else to be strong enough to form a party of his own that is where i have come to the cul-de-sac in my career it was my ambition to guide the working classes of the country into their rightful place in our social scheme but i have also always been an intensely keen imperialist and therefore at daggers drawn with many of the so-called labor leaders the consequence has been that for ten years i have been hanging on to the thin edge of nothing a member of the coalition government a member by sufferance of a hotchpotch party which was created by the combination of the radicals and the unionists with the sole idea of seeing the country through its great crisis all legislation in the wider sense of the term had to be shelved while the country was in danger and while it was recovering itself that time i spent striving to educate the people i wanted to represent striving to make them see reason to combat the two elements in their outlook which have been their in eternal drawback the elements of blatant selfishness and greedy ignorance well i failed that is all there is about it i failed no party claims me 
i haven't even a seat in the house of commons i am nearly fifty years old and i am tired nearly fifty years old she repeated but what is that you have health you are strong and well there is nothing a younger man can do that you cannot why do you worry about your age perhaps he admitted with a faint smile and an innate compulsion to tell her of the thought which had lurked behind because you are so marvellously young absurd she scoffed i am twenty-nine years old practically thirty practically thirty that is to say with the usual twenty years allowance you and i are of the same age he looked across at her across the lace draped table with its bowls of fruit its richly cut decanter of wine its low bowl of roses its haze of cigarette smoke she was leaning back in her chair her head resting upon the fingers of one hand her face seemed alive with so many emotions she was so anxious to console so interested in her companion herself and the moment he felt something unexpected and irresistible i would to god i could look at it like that he exclaimed suddenly the words had left his lips before he was conscious that the thought which had lain at the back of them had found expression in his tone and glance just at first they produced no other effect in her save that evidenced by the gently upraised eyebrows the sweetly tolerant smile and then a sudden cloud scarcely of discomfiture certainly not of displeasure more of unrest swept across her face her eyes no longer met his so clearly and frankly there was a little mist there and a silence she was looking away through the windows to the dim pearly line of blue the actual horizon of things present her pulses were scarcely steady she was possessed to a full extent of the qualities of courage physical and spiritual yet at that moment she felt a wave of curious fear the fear of the idealist that she may not be true to herself the moment passed and she looked at him with a smile an innate gift of concealment the heritage of her sex came to her rescue but she felt somehow or other as though she had passed through one of the crises of her life that she could never be quite the same again she had ceased for those few seconds to be natural what does that wish mean she asked do you mean that you would like to agree with me or would you like to be twenty-nine he too turned his back upon that little pool of emotion did his best to be natural and easy to shut out the memory of that flaming moment at twenty-nine he told her i was first secretary at st petersburg i am afraid that i was rather a dull dog too all russia even then was seething and i was trying to understand i never did no one ever understood russia the explanation of all that has happened there is simply the eternal duplication of history a huge class of people physically omnipotent conscious of wrongs unintelligent and led by false prophets all revolutions are the same the purging is too severe so the good remains undone there followed a silence purposeful on her part scarcely realized by him she sought for means of escape to bring their conversation down to the level where alone safety lay she moved her chair a little farther back into the scented chamber as though she found the sunlight too dazzling you are like so many of the men who work for us she said you are just a little tired aren't you you come down here to rest and i dig up all the old problems and ask you to vex yourself with them we must talk about slighter things you are going to shoot here this season perhaps hunt later on i do not think so he answered i have forgotten what sports mean i may take a gun out sometimes there is a little shooting that goes with the manor but very few birds i believe the last ten years seem to have driven all those things out of one's mind don't you think that you are inclined to take life a little too earnestly she asked one should have amusements i may feel the necessity he replied but it is not easy to take up one's earlier pleasures at my time of life don't think me inquisitive 
she went on but as i told you i have looked you up in one of those wonderful books which tell us everything about everybody you were a double blue at oxford rackets and cricket he assented neither of them much use to me now rackets would help you with lawn tennis she said but beyond that i find that not a dozen years ago you were a scratch golfer and you certainly won the amateur championship of italy it is eleven years since i touched a club he told her then you ought to be ashamed of yourself she declared games are part of an englishman's life and when he neglects them altogether there is something wrong i shall insist upon your taking up lawn tennis again i have two beautiful courts there and very seldom any one to play with who has the least idea of the game his eyes rested for a moment upon the smoothly shaven lawns so you think that regeneration may come to me through lawn tennis he murmured and why not you are taking yourself far too seriously you know how do you expect regeneration to come shall i tell you what it is i lack he answered suddenly incentive i think my will has suddenly grown flabby the ego in me unresponsive you know the moods in which one asks oneself whether it is worth while whether anything is worth while well i am there at the crossroads i think i feel more inclined to look for a seat than to go on the strongest of us need to rest sometimes she agreed quietly he relapsed into a silence so apparently deliberate that she accepted it as a respite for herself also from the greater seclusion of her shadowy seat she found herself presently able to watch him unnoticed the brooding melancholy of his face the nervous unsatisfied mouth the discontent of his sombre brows then even as she watched the change in his expression startled her his eyes were fixed upon the narrow ribbon of road which twisted around the other side of the house and led over the bleaker moors seawards the look puzzled her gave her an uncomfortable feeling its note of appreciation seemed to her inexplicable with a quaint electrical sympathy he caught the unspoken question in her eyes and translated it you are beginning to doubt me he said you are wondering if the shadow i carry with me is not something more than the mere depression of a man who has failed you have not failed she declared and i never doubt you but there was something in your face just then which was strange something alien to our talk it was as though you saw something ominous in the distance it is true he admitted in the distance i can see the car i ordered to come and fetch me there is a passenger a man in the tonneau i am wondering who he is someone to whom your man has given a lift perhaps she suggested he shook his head i have another feeling perhaps i should say an apprehension it is someone who brings news political or domestic neither he answered i thought that fate had dealt me out most of her evil tricks when i came down here a political outcast she had another one up her sleeve however do you read your morning papers every day she confessed is it a weakness not at all you read of the disappearance of the honourable anthony palliser of course she answered besides you told me about it did you not yesterday afternoon i know one of his sisters quite well and i was looking forward to seeing something of him down here i was obliged to dismiss him at a moment's notice tallente went on he betrayed his trust and he has disappeared that very imposing police inspector who broke up our tete -tete yesterday afternoon and i fear shortened your visit came on his account he was the spokesman for a superior authority in london they have come to the conclusion that i could if i chose throw some light upon his disappearance and could you he rose to his feet you are the one person in the world he said to whom i could tell nothing but the truth i could they both heard the sound of footsteps in the hall lady jane disturbed by the ominous note in tallente's voice rose also to her feet glancing from him towards the door filled with some vague inexplicable apprehension tallente showed no fear but it was plain that he had 
nerved himself to face evil things there was something almost ludicrous in this denouement to a situation which to both had seemed filled with almost dramatic possibilities the door was opened by parkins the stout discreet manservant ushering in the unkempt ill-tailored ungainly figure of james miller this gentleman parkins announced wishes to see mr tallente on urgent business End of chapter seven